First, a new edition of Fresh Eyes, our segment on regional issues from a youth perspective. Ashland High School's Truth to Power Club's Isadora Malay and Simone Starbird continue their examination of gun violence and its impact. They speak with students and parents about their feelings around the threat of school shootings. You're listening to Fresh Eyes, where we explore regional issues from a youth perspective. In our most recently published episode, we explored what swatting is, a purposefully false report of gunfire on school campuses, and how it affects Oregon schools. In this episode, we dive deeper into the topic of gun violence, considering how it affects students and parents, what they think perpetuates the issue, and what solutions might be. Fresh Eyes is brought to you by Truth to Power on Jefferson Public Radio. I'm Isadora Malay. And I'm Simone Starbird. We were first curious to learn how living in America, which according to the Gun Violence Archive counts 224 mass shootings in 2023 already, affects the everyday lives of students and parents. My name is Aaliyah John, and I'm a senior at the Ashland High School. The other day I was like sitting in my French classroom and it connects to another classroom and I was like, oh, this would be a good place to see if there was ever a school shooting. My name's Aurora Graham and I'm a junior at Ashland High School. If something actually happened, like, We wouldn't just sit here. We'd all jump out this back window and go down to Bear Creek. I'm Owen Foss. I go to South Medford High School. I'm in 11th grade. I am 16 years old. I kind of like have always thought in my head about things I might do in a situation like this, which is unfortunate because it's not something you should have to like prepare mentally for. It kind of like demoralizes you. I think the prevalence of the situation brings out a certain anxiety in me, distracting me from school when I'm thinking about these things. And that can lead to a certain amount of anxiety for me where it's like, okay, well, now not only am I distracting myself from school and I'm not actually getting anything done, now I'm also thinking about these like danger situations that are just like horrible. My name is Jennifer Rader and my daughter attends Ashland High School. Unfortunately, your generation, mass shootings happen so often in this country that you are not having just one incident that you were traumatized from, but multiple. So you may have had an incident in elementary school, middle school, high school, and then college. It's not just one occurrence in your lifetime. It's now becoming regular. As a parent, my heart breaks that you guys are being robbed of your childhood. I'm Emmy Graham and I'm a parent of a high school student in Ashland. It's terrifying. If I really think about it, it's terrifying. It's such a senseless, stupid thing. And if I lost my child to gun violence, I don't think I'd want to live. To look into why America specifically has such high rates of gun violence, we asked our interviewees what they thought the real cause of school shootings is. Your generation has brought the awareness of mental health issues and the type of stress that you are all under into the spotlight, but nothing is being done about it. There are no additional programs. There's no um, mental health check-ins or exercises that you guys can do to relieve some of this stress. And I worry that someone is not going to be able to handle the pressure and the stress in their life and take it out on on the school. My name is Quinn Hall and I'm 17 and a senior at South Medford. We, we see school shootings as pretty much a uniquely American thing. We also have really high rates of depression and things like that that, that cause these school shooters to act the way that they do. People who are isolated and ostracized from society end up like becoming these school shooters because of their resentment. And I think they usually like connect to that resentfulness through like other people who feel similar. And I think that's sort of adding to the rise of online extremism. We've seen people who have been like uh, convinced or helped with school shootings through like websites like 4chan and stuff like that that are pretty much designed around um, groups that feel isolated from society and resentful. I feel like the problem maybe isn't guns, because, like, if you gave me a gun, I wouldn't go do something violent like that. 
it has to be something deeper. Like, it doesn't happen in other countries. And, like, it didn't used to happen. Like, it's a relatively new problem that we're facing. I went to high school in the 70s. I graduated in 81. And I never heard of this. Never. I never heard about it happening. Not even rumors about it happening in the city or anything like that. But I grew up, as I said, in a rural area where most people uh, hunted. So almost everyone I knew had guns or rifles. But I never felt threatened by that. Everyone felt like they were very sensible with those guns and rifles. Most of the people who like commit shootings are generally white males. That's a very interesting statistic to think about because if the shooters were women, society wouldn't be like, oh, it's because of the gun problem because we let people have too many guns. It'd be like something's wrong with women. I think it's a public health crisis because if disturbed people have access to such to weapons of harm that can kill so many people at once, that's a crisis. When discussing the reasons for gun violence and school shootings, some of our interviewees brought mental illness into the conversation. While this is certainly a contributor in some cases, there is a lack of data that proves that mental illness is a root cause of gun violence. The biggest problem stems from awareness. These school shootings are really easy, able to just be perceived as a statistic. The U.S. is leading in the number of school shootings by like a margin of 250. So we have like 280 plus recorded. And then second place was Mexico at 30. The rest of the world where it was recorded is around at like two to zero. Nationally, we could be making more progress, but just like our two political parties are just so polarized that we can't agree on anything. I don't know, it's hard because nationally, I think everyone knows that it's an issue, but I think some people choose to look past that because they have an attachment to their guns. When the issue of school shootings is discussed, the conversation usually lands on the argument of whether or not America needs increased gun control. We were interested to know what our interviewees thought about this argument and the prevalence of guns in America as a whole. The number of guns outnumbers the population we have in this country. That makes no sense. You just need one gun. You can only fire one at a time. I don't think there's a reason to buy like assault weapons, like semi-automatic rifles. Like personally on the argument of self-defense that these people have, like I would say that having a pistol for home defense is just fine. I would enforce stricter gun laws. And I think that having shootings be such like a prevalent thing growing up makes me just want to say like, get rid of all the guns growing up. And just like having this lingering fear of school shootings has just, and like mass shootings, like even like going out shopping or something like makes me just hate guns. We do have certain tools in the state of Oregon. We have enacted those red flag laws. These laws allow police departments uh, to either like recognize or petition to a court to uh, seize weapons from people that they deem dangerous to themselves or others. They're a really good tool for the state and police departments, but they're not utilized enough. Like, I don't really know how much gun laws would actually help other than completely removing all guns. Like, I think nine out of 10 criminals get their guns illegally. Now, the number of school shooters that do so is a lot less. Usually they get them from buying them once they're 18 or getting them through a family member or friend. But I still think that that shows that if they didn't have those avenues, they would still be able to get them illegally. And I, I feel like other than pretty much stopping all um, all gun production at all and then just like doing really strict background checks, I don't really know if there's much that we can do on the gun control level. But I would just like to see more effort being made to like stop people with bad intentions from obtaining these weapons in the first place. I mean, I guess the first step would just be control what you can control. Regarding controlling what we can control, some states have laws that successfully address gun violence. According to Every Town for Gun Safety, states with laws making the reporting of stolen and lost firearms mandatory see a 46% decrease in illegal gun movement. 
Implementing specific measures like this throughout the country could result in a decrease in school shootings, or at least wider spread issues of gun violence. And I think that like just sort of trying to figure out what we can do to combat like online extremism would help prevent these things like helping like commissioning studies into what actually causes people to feel resentful at society and things like that what like figuring out what we can do to stop people from feeling this way and what we can do to get people back on the right track and become safe members of society again the decision of whether or not to increase gun control in the interest of student safety seems to rest on the national government however the question that remains is What can we, as students, parents, and community members, do to ensure our student safety and lessen their fear of school shootings and the impact it has on their education? But on our community level, being more prepared, being more educated about what can happen and what we can do. There's some safety precautions that we talked about in the school district meetings, school board meetings, about things that can be improved on the campus, Um, having a security guard, walking campus, um, especially it being an open campus, replacing all of the large windows of the older buildings with bulletproof glass, Um, having automatic locks. The way I feel most schools specifically are designed is that they have like one police officer on standby at the place and that's already kind of like not that fun. And then you have all the fences and everything and that just kind of like adds a sense of like we're kind of like in a big cage you also are aware that these preparations also make it harder for you to escape in a sense it's just worrying going to a school and just seeing fences everywhere it's i guess depressing in a sense in our most recently published fresh eyes episode about swatting Lieutenant Jeff Kirkpatrick from the Medford Police Department talked about the presence of school resource officers, or SROs, in Medford schools. These sworn law enforcement officers work permanently at the school they are assigned to and communicate with the school district, police department, and students about threats so that they are present and on campus addressing issues right away. Lieutenant Kirkpatrick elaborates on the effect of these SROs. The uh, tips that these school resource officers get from students about other student behavior has has saved countless lives just in our schools. Um, I can think of multiple incidents where we have stopped what would be school shootings in our in our jurisdiction um, simply because we have dedicated resource officers at the schools. Would you like to see a security guard on campus? Yes. I I think we either make our schools into prison systems with guards and checks, which is not something I favor. Or we try to get to the root problem, which perhaps is more gun control and uh, mental health checks on our young men. While there are many possibilities for communities to work to make schools a safer environment, not all actions are unanimously agreed upon. Additionally, implementing programs, whether it be for SROs, campus modifications, or mental health help, takes time, energy, and money. When facing the reality of how hard it can be to make change, it's important to not give up and to have hope and use it as a motivator. Working towards a safer future without the level of gun violence seen today will be an intergenerational effort. New programs can be initiated with collaboration and persistence. If communities hold each other accountable for working towards a better future with tangible results, our schools will see the difference. So, while working towards this, don't lose hope no matter the barriers and adversity. There is hope. There is hope for your generation. You you are more aware and more active than my generation. Exactly. We have to trust that we're going to have a normal school day. All kids are safe in their community. They're all safe in their school. And they can go off and learn and excel in who they are. We just have to, uh, it used to be something we could expect. Now we just have to hope for it, I suppose. You've been listening to Fresh Eyes, brought to you by Truth to Power on Jefferson Public Radio. This podcast was produced by Isadora Malay and Simone Starbird with music from Artlist.io. We'd like to thank all of our interviewees and the JPR team for their additions to this podcast.